It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 649 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I am honored to be joined by my guest on the show today. Joining me is Fred Schilmover. Fred is the founder and CEO at Insight Squared. And in today's episode, we're going to dive into the topic of using data to help drive change in your sales teams, your sales processes, you know, anywhere you have the imperative to make a change. Because the impetus for change can come from many sources and for many reasons. But be that as it may, increasingly now we have the data to help us learn what to do, to help us learn how to allocate our time correctly, you know, to focus our energies on the right accounts at the right time, they're going to have the highest likelihood to close. And in our conversation, Fred and I talk about what some perceive as perhaps as the dangers of, of data, leading too much use, reliance on data, let's say, leading to what some might call the mechanization of sales. But then we're going to dive into some best practices for how to use data to help manage, scale, and grow your sales team. If you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, go to andypaul.com forward slash 649. Now, friends, let me say that I do hear from listeners quite a bit, many that are looking for a new sales challenge and looking for advice. You know, what, what should they do? And I tell them that, to my way of thinking, the most important elements to career success are make sure you align yourself with the right company, you know, the one that develops its employees, invests in the development of its employees, values customers, and has a portfolio of category-leading products that can compete with anyone. And so with its recent acquisition of Level 3, the new CenturyLink has become a world leader in many segments, including cloud security and managed services. And so if you're a top sales producer and you're looking to challenge yourself in order to take your career to the next level, then I urge you to visit CenturyLink.com forward slash accelerate and join their talent community and maybe see if CenturyLink is the right step for you and your career. Also, before I talk with Fred, let me remind you again about the upcoming Sales Leadership Accelerated Mastermind. We call that SAS SLAM for short. This is an accelerated mastermind for SaaS sales leaders. It kicks off on April 24th. Now, SaaS Slam is limited to founders, CEOs, CROs, and VPs of sales of high-growth SaaS companies only. I'm here stumbling over my own tongue. And we call it an accelerated mastermind because in just two days, you'll become better prepared to transform how you sell, how you scale, and how you develop the capabilities of your team to crush your goals. We want to thank our corporate partners who are supporting us on SaaS Slam, including Storm Ventures, Outreach, Chorus, G2 Crowd, and Membrane. Now, for more information about SaaS Slam and to apply for your place at the table, go to www.sasslam.com forward slash event one. That's S A A S S L A M dot com forward slash event one. All right, let's get into it. Fred, welcome to Accelerate. Really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining me. So, um, I, you know, I started the show with the same question that I asked my guests. And, and the question is, in your opinion, what's, what's the single biggest challenge facing salespeople today? Yeah, I think there's a lot of information, but not a lot of insight. So, uh, you know, obviously, big data has has been a, a theme for a long time, and you know, the the amount of data keeps doubling every year. I forgot exactly what the right stat is, uh, but that doesn't mean that necessarily people are taking insight from that. And I think we're flooded with information, we're flooded with applications, um, but actually, how do we drive better behavior is something that I think is sh- in short supply. Yeah, I mean, I think that that. You're absolutely right on. This is a theme that I keep coming back to is, is that we seem unprepared, as a sales professional, certainly within sales, unprepared to use the data that's, that's generated. I mean, it's, it's most of it, and I'm sure it'll, it's not the first time I've heard this, but you know, people fall prey to their confirmation biases. They look at this data and say, yep, that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, then, as opposed to saying, oh, what's that really trying to tell me? Yeah, I'll give you a good example. So a lot of times uh, I spend a lot of energy uh, fighting rules of thumb. So for example, mm-hmm. uh, with with uh, pipeline coverage. So how much pipeline do I need at the start of every quarter in order to hit my number at the end of every quarter? And I bet if you ask a lot of people, you know, what's what your pipeline coverage should be, people say, you know, about you know three to one. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, <laughs> five to and, one. And I just heard what, I just heard a company say they needed eight to ten times, and I'm like. Okay. Are you, are well, you planning whatever, on closing it? Whatever, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, whatever the number is, uh, when we actually look at the d- data uh, quantitatively, historically, uh, it tends to be more. So back to your point about, about bias, people tend to overestimate their win rates, underestimate their sales cycles, uh, and underestimate how much pipeline coverage they actually have needed to hit the numbers they've hit in the past. So I spent we, we spent a lot of our energy uh, fighting rules of thumb. Here's another funny one. Sure. And if, any, if any of your listeners do this, uh, please don't admit it to me. But uh, we work with organizations and um, – uh, to help them understand their sales process and look for areas uh, to improve. And one of the things you want to look at, you know, sort of one of the basic fundamental metrics is conversion rate, not mm-hmm. just my my win rate, you know, how many opportunities did I win over the sum of total opportunities, but actually break it down stage by stage. And one thing that that sort of to me is like, you know, scratch scratching on a chalkboard is when I see people name their stages with percentages, you know, mm-hmm. st- stage three is my 50%, mm-hmm. stage four is my 90%. And uh, that doesn't make sense to me on a number of levels, which I can get into. But also invariably what happens back to that bias is when we actually go and look and aggregate what their win rate is from their 50% stage, it's typically 25%. Right. And their, their 90% stage is probably 60%. So people overestimate. And as a, as a result, that's that's one of the reasons they fall short. Um, the other problem with that is the answer is much more nuanced, nuanced than something you can you can label with a you know, percent stage. You know, it changes over time. It changes by this customer segment that you serve. It certainly changes rep to rep. And by uh, looking at things in sort of that blunt manner, um, again, all the data exists, but not all the insights are surfaced, and that's something that sort of uh, we feel pretty passionately about at Insight Squared. Yeah, I mean the expression I use when when you get these sort of weighted probabilities based on stage of of the uh, of the sales process, which is you know you can lay it out linearly. As as I say, well, it's like trying to measure probability with a yardstick, and you can't do it. Well, what do you what do you mean by that? Well, is that everybody says, look. If, again, if we assume we have sort of a linear process, you know, stage to say stage, and yeah, we get to the proposal stage, well, that's my 90% stage. Well, the fact is you have three competitors, they're saying the exact same thing. You can't all have 90% probability of winning the deal at that point. Right. Um, nor, nor, nor can you win 90% of a single deal. So Right. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, is just because you've reached a certain stage or a certain point, you've traveled a certain distance, that's what the yardstick comes at, just because you've traveled a certain distance in your, your uh, sales process, it has nothing to correlate to probability. Yeah, one of the things we see, just sticking on this point for or this thread for one more second here, is um, you're right on a single deal that doesn't work. But when you have enough uh, of a pipeline to look at it in aggregate, mm-hmm. uh, there are organizations for whom this weighted pipeline approach works. Now we add to it a, a couple uh, interesting nuances. For example, we look at the uh, conversion rates rep by rep. Mm-hmm. Uh, we take into account uh, the sales cycle stage by stage and likelihood of closing in this period. So, like, we we not only look at likelihood of winning the deal ever, we look at likelihood of winning the deal this month, this quarter. Uh, and we overlay that across the whole pipeline. And there are organizations that on a very consistent basis, that's predictive. And the reason for that is partly the nature of their business. Uh, if there's less variability customer to customer, right. if there's More consistency in behavior. Uh, so that transactional means to me volume of data. So yes, the, the, the higher, the, the larger the data set, um, the less margin for error from a statistical perspective. But there's also a execution component, which is, if your team is executing and being managed in a very tight and predictable way, you're going to get more predictability um, and less variation. It's all about variation, deal to deal, rep to rep. And as a result, um, not only have a more predictable business, but also have a more predictable business using a tool like a weighted pipeline. So it all kind of ties together. So what does it mean to manage predictably? Yeah, so there's, 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 <laughs> that, that's a big question. Um, I, I, so, I think there are two parts of managing sales, and we sort of break down what we do into different use cases that we serve our customers with. And uh, two of the use cases are around rep individual management, you know, the coaching, the ramping, modeling success, all of that, performance management, and then the pipeline management. How do I sort of squeeze the most out of this very perishable asset that I have called pipeline? Mm -hmm. 
And the two things operate on very different cadences. Um, like ultimately, the result is we 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 sell more, we're more successful. Um, but it actually, in in, our, in my opinion, makes sense to break the two out because the the cycles of activity are different. So when you're trying to win a deal, you don't necessarily have time to identify. You know what? I see this rep is struggling with uh, negotiation. Let me take four hours out of my day right now to run through the negotiation training uh, that that we have in place. What you're probably going to want to do is short short circuit. At the, the process, whether you jump in there or you know sh- uh, provide provide the answer rather than helping someone find the answer, because you want to win the deal and that's important. But you also want to kind of make a note to yourself or put into sort of put a pin in this idea that as we set our OKRs for uh, career development, as we decide what trainings to run through, as we think about these. Um, sort of out-of-band coaching moments, uh, that's where we'll pick up these things that I learn in the sort of day-to-day tactical. So I, I think, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I've seen really change in sales over the last 10 years, the steam I have, is this idea of industrialization of sales. And what that means is changing it, and you've heard this before, I'm sure, is sort of for, from an art to a science, but that I don't think that gives it enough Uh, of an explanation. So um, if you think about like the industrial revolution, uh, production went from very artisanal, unique, one-off, less scalable, uh, more variation, certainly more variation in quality to this, you know, division of labor, factory oriented, reduced cycle time. And that that continues uh, through today with automation. I think a lot of that is happening with sales. And there's a couple trends that enable that. And, and I will come back to the point of what this means to, to manage sales, but uh, one, this idea of consumerization of IT. So we're, we, we're in technology, we sell technology, and I think uh, where we've seen, uh, you know, whether it's Moore's Law with, with uh, processing and, and sort of power and price, or in general, um, software moving from on-prem to the cloud, uh, you're, you're seeing costs co- collapse, uh, sort of compress. As a result, uh, sales needed to innovate because you can't have you know super expensive you know reps in the field uh, selling ten thousand dollars software, um, and there's been a ton of innovation and movement from field sales to inside sales. Not that field sales is going away, but you know the the Bridge Group publishes uh, you know great great uh, surveys on the the change of job recs from field sales to inside sales over, over the last ten years, and it's been pretty dramatic. And with that has uh, there have been a bunch of enabling technologies. You know, Insight Squared is one of them. You know, whether it's Skype or Zoom or GoToMeeting, um, you know, Salesforce being in the cloud. Uh, we use a bunch of tools to help enable our team to be more effective and develop relationships that you once had to develop in the field, uh, doing it sort of uh, remotely. And in that process, um, I think sales now requires a much more engineering minded management style. It's more about operations management and it's more uh, industrial in nature than just the art of the deal. And I think that that that's the part of sales that, you know, when, when I think of sales now, I do think of it from an operations management perspective. And every component of sales can be broken out into this balancing e- equation. And ultimately, uh, it's almost an engineering function to design, you know, design the system, make sure that you have, uh, you know, the balance of the BDRs and the AEs and the pipeline and um, the customer success team and, and all of the, the roles supporting, uh, you know, sort of operating much like you would in a factory. So yeah, long-winded, I mean, long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the, this idea of, you call it the industrialization, I call it the mechanization of sales, um, yep. certainly certainly exists. But I think that, that someone might listen to your answer and say, well, there's still a human component oh, to sales. I, I- I think the human component is evolving. So, okay, so what I didn't mean to say is there will be no salespeople uh, and we're going to automate the stuff and it's all going to be AI chatbots and, and this, that, and the other. I think that um, what we've done is created efficiencies such that rather than, and go, I'm going to go back to the field sales example, rather than spending half my time driving around in a car covering my territory, I could spend 100% of my time or a much larger percentage of my time face-to-face, even if virtually with my customers, developing those relationships. So I think to some extent, uh, sales can now become more personal 
just in a more scalable manner. I mean, you, you think about building relationships with, you know, with dating and how technology has changed that. It didn't eliminate dating and there's no matchmaking service uh, or there's no rise of matchmaking services because of technology. What it did is rather than having to ask your three friends to introduce you to people, uh, by the way, I did meet my wife on a blind date that my <laughs> friend, friend introduced me to, but, uh, but uh, more and more uh, I, that people make buying decisions exclusively on the merits. Like people don't make business decisions intellectually. They make them emotionally and justify yes. their emotion with data. Right. Uh, but ultimately it's a rationalization. So I don't think that we're taking the human touch out of the equation. I think we're creating efficiencies around it. And it, be, it's be, it becomes more and more important to have that personal relationship. You can just do it at scale. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, if you'd ever read Jeff Colvin's book about humans are underrated, uh, talking about some of these these trends is, I think, yeah, the ability to form human relationships actually will become more valued skill as opposed to less. Exactly. Um, yeah, interesting. It, it's so funny. You, while you were talking, a uh, sort of random thought occurred to me. It's, it's like you're talking about you know field sales and so on. And, and you know, the more I, I talk to people, the more I, I begin to think that people – really didn't understand what field sales was. <laughs> and I think there's somewhat a, I don't know, a general, I don't want to say generational, but just, you know, point in time, at least in the technology side. Now, clearly there always were products made more retail, consumer oriented, uh, you know, distributors and so on where, you know, field reps are in the field all the time. That's just what they did. Um, but I mean, I was always in technology and in my career and I'm, I'm old. I go, I go way back. Um, yeah, I was a field sales guy, but I, I probably spent, you know, 30% of my time in the field. The rest was on the phone. You know, I, I try to make the point to people is that I still did the bulk even back then, and this was back, you know, decades we're talking, still spent the bulk of my time forming my relationships virtually. Yep. But you didn't, you didn't have the addition. So you, you did the field trips in order to sort of, and my guess is I, I, I wasn't doing sales, um, you know, <laughs> at, at that point. Uh, but, um, but I imagine you did the field trips in order to solidify the relationships because you couldn't do it over the phone and you lacked the technology that exists today to do that. Yeah. I mean, the, the field trips tend to be more stage exit events, right? Migrate from stage migration events, move from one stage to the next. Yep. And um, but otherwise, and I was just telling somebody on a call I had before you and I got hopped on the on this recording is is yeah I, back in you know eighties and nineties yeah I was VP of sales at some startups we were selling some really large complex communication systems but our company our customers were eighty percent in Europe and Asia so no internet how'd you how'd you find people to call I mean we we're just we we're cold calling. Right, we we're making, and so we'd only see those prospects or those customers. We might close a five million dollar deal, only see them twice. Yep, and and uh, the question is, how efficient was that process then? Uh, just the demand generation part. Oh, horribly compared inefficient. to what it is today. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah I, I would have killed for some of the things that are available today to do that. Not that, and again, this I don't get down this path or. Yeah, you know, people say, "Oh, you think it was harder then or easier then versus harder now?" Whatever. Yeah, you know, sales is just hard, right? It doesn't matter what tools you have. It's it was hard, but yeah, I could have used some of those things. It certainly, would have made made the whole thing more efficient for sure. That's why I look at tools like yours uh, and others with with longing, <laughs> thinking about <laughs> if I could go right. back and do it again, it would have been fantastic. And that's being forced upon the industry because tools like ours, you know, 10 years ago would have cost, you know, over a million dollars. And now oh, we brought yeah. that cost w way down. So to some extent, that that uh, consumerization of IT that I talked about forced the industry down this path. Absolutely. Or maybe they, they just happened in parallel in a way that nece that was necessitated. Oh, yeah. I mean, so we're going to jump in now to what you guys do. But I mean, it would have, what was that, you know, crystal reports, what are those customer report generated you would have had on your ERP, ERP system. You had gone to IT and requested something and taken a month and maybe they've gotten it to you. I've spent a fair number of hours in Crystal. <laughs> in Crystal, right. So, all right. So tell us a little bit about Insight Squared because I, I think many people have heard about it, but yeah, our listeners are certain to be small, mid-sized enterprises. Um, yeah, tell us about what you guys do and what was the impetus for starting the company? 
Yeah, so I have kind of two ways to describe it really simply. One is, you know, Insight Squared has all of the reports that you wish your C- your CRM did, but for some reason it doesn't. That's the, the simplest way to describe it. <laughs> love uh, it, love and, it. And another way to think about it is, like, if you had the best sales operations team on the planet with unlimited time, they would want to build Insight Squared because that's kind of what we've done. So rather than, and we don't put ourselves in the category of business intelligence, so, you know, BI has been around for a very long time. I think it's been largely unchanged, even as it's moved into the cloud. It still requires, you know, superhumans to uh, to operate it, and mere mortals like myself. Uh, actually, my head of product, my co-founder, uh, likes to say his goal is to make a so a product so easy that even a CEO can use it. And then he typically gives me a funny funny look. Um, but uh, you know, our our approach was uh, we picked a major. Our major's revenue. We went to, and it's not that we have the smartest people uh, on the planet. Uh, we actually leveraged economies of scale. We crowdsourced ideas. We went to sales leaders and sales operations leaders and said, if you could wave a magic wand, what answer would help you drive revenue better? And we found lots of pattern in the types of questions. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of explained them before. It's all around, I want to figure out how to maximize my pipeline. I want to figure out how to coach my reps to be more successful. I want to uh, figure out how to forecast more accurately so I can have credibility with my board and know how many people to hire. Uh, I don't want to have to cram for the exam every time I have a board meeting or a QBR. I just want the stuff to show up and don't want to have to argue about whose Excel spreadsheet is right. So those are the things that we sort of built a, we like to think of it as a consumer-grade app in terms of ease of use and uh, sort of uh, fast time to value. Um, and people come to us not just because we do you know, computations and pretty charts. People come to us because we have content, because we have worked with, uh, at this point, tens of thousands of, of sales leaders and sales operations leaders. So we have accumulated a library of sort of best practices um, in terms of sales, sales operations, how should you structure your CRM? How should you structure it for different industries? Uh, and also, people come to us and say, you know what, we're we're in growth mode. You know, one of the reasons you want to work with Insight Squared is because you have an imperative to change. If you're perfectly happy with what happened last year and you just want to repeat it again this year, then just repeat your activities. Uh, but most of the folks we work with want to improve something. They want to, you know, grow their revenue, grow their bottom line. They want to improve a win rate or something. Uh, so you have an imperative to change, and. W- Folks come to us and say, okay, you've worked with thousands of organizations that have changed. What have you seen work? Can you apply your tools to sort of diagnose um, where we are? Uh, so, sort of in, a, in the maturity level of our sales operations our, and our infrastructure and prescribe uh, prescribe a solution. And uh, you asked like uh, sort of where, where we came from. Well, I remember in business school, and I didn't come from a sort of finance or management consulting or one of these backgrounds. My background is actually, you know, IT consulting. And uh, very long story, got into venture capital, and from there uh, went to business school. And I met these people with, you know, who worked for McKinsey and Bain and BCG and you know, private equity and, and investment banks, and like the toolkits that they had were amazing. But I thought back of myself, of myself, you know, in IT consulting, I didn't have any of those toolkits. And I thought, wow, if I could apply that knowledge um, to a broad set of businesses, essentially, like take a manage, put a management consultant in a box and sell it uh, for a reasonable price um, that small and large businesses could afford, but also that was accessible, that knowledge was accessible to them, like how much of a game changer could that be? And, and that was sort of the, the impetus uh, for us starting Insight Squared. Okay, great. But so the... I think people were sort of understand is okay. Well, where where do you get this data that you're analyzing? Yeah. So look, it uh, we we focus on uh, everything uh, revenue related. So the the majority of our customers uh, are our are, are Salesforce.com customers. So mm-hmm. we have a great partnership with them, uh, and then we pull in other relevant data. So we connect to you know 50 other data providers that help answer questions around revenue. So whether it's your you know your marketing automation system or your revenue recognition system, to have a complete picture. Um, that's uh, those are the types of systems we connect to. And you mentioned Salesforce primarily, but is it only Salesforce? Uh, from a CRM perspective, yeah. uh, that that that's the market that we that we focus on. Okay, all right. So um, you talk about products or breaks down into at least uh, the terms. I think these are relatively newer terms. At least when I was using the product as tiles and slates. So tiles being sort of your standard reports, 
Uh, yes, yeah, yes. The way I would think about that is uh, we solve for those four use cases that I mentioned: rep management, pipeline management, mm-hmm. forecast accuracy, and planning and analysis. And we have a couple different tools that we use to solve for those. So Tiles uh, is the out of the box, easy to use, up and running quickly um, uh, toolkit that we have. And then we have Slate, which can extend those use cases. So we we try to have very high coverage. So regardless of you know the type of business that you run, the sales model, the way you've structured your your sales force, uh, we we can adapt to that with tiles. But there are there are sometimes things that are like so idiosyncratic that we don't cover it, uh, and you may want to extend those use cases using Slate. You also may just love working with Insight Squared and want to bring in more data. So for example, we've got a customer in particular I'm thinking of that puts puts in all of their product and their usage data mm-hmm. and looks for correlation between things like, you know, uh, sales cycle or marketing channel and the uh, usage and adoption of the product post sales and tries to understand where's the quality revenue coming from. So if you want to build sort of brand new use cases, you can do that in Slate as well. Yeah, very cool. I mean, I, I remember, again, when I was using it uh, with this one client is more of a sales process analysis Yep. and analyzing rep behavior, I guess, as you mentioned. And yeah, it was, it was it was very valuable. I mean, just by looking at the variances in in close rates based on people's processes and the steps they took at various points in the the sales process. Um, and the important thing there is is really the accessibility. So, yeah. like um, the fact that you know business users, line of business people feel comfortable going in there, pivoting, drilling, filtering, interrogating that data, asking that secondary and tertiary question, like, well, what about it from this perspective? And what about that question? The problem with uh, not having Insight Squared is you've got to ask someone, typically an analyst, to run the analysis for you. And, um, you know, one of my co-founders used to say that the, the biggest problem with software development isn't the software, it's the communication of requirements. Now, of course, he would say that because he was right. <laughs> In the software, but sure. uh, uh, but he's right, and, and and oftentimes what would happen is you know you ask someone uh, in an analytics role to to uh, a specific question, and there's a misinterpretation there. Maybe you fail to communicate it, maybe they fail to understand it, and uh, invariably, what I find the last mile of uh, analytics is still Excel, and uh, you know whatever mm-hmm. the the back end system, powerful back end system is that the, the analysis is running. Eventually, someone gets an Excel spreadsheet, and you say, ah, "This isn't quite right. Can we ask it again?" And uh, you know, just because I'm the CEO doesn't mean I get to the front of that queue. So instead of answering my my questions and the, the next questions that come after that real time, I've got to wait. And by the time I get the Excel spreadsheet that I'm looking for, kind of the moment has passed. And that's the experience that fundamentally we're trying to change. So let's extend that a little bit further. So if, in terms of actual usage of your, your product, what sort of the ideal customer profile look like? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it ranges. I mean, the, the most important thing is that you have an imperative uh, to to improve something, to change something. Uh, we work, as far as like the, the, the people that we work with, uh, it's really great when uh, a company has invested in sales operations. I could talk about that uh, more broadly. Now, we can help a company that doesn't yet have sales operations, but I think one of the trends I'm seeing is more and more earlier and earlier, sort of smaller and smaller companies are investing in sales operations, and, and we feel very passionately about that trend. Um, but we work primarily as far as like who are the users of our product. The users of our product are, are primarily management, all the way from executive level down to the frontline sales managers. And where we're really successful is where this is built into the routine of people's behavior. So it is it is the thing that you do to run your, your pipeline mm-hmm. meeting. It is the thing that you use to run your monthly coaching. It is the thing that you use to do your weekly forecasting. And when we've sort of embedded ourselves into that workflow, that's where we're able to drive the most value. So let's go back a second on your comment about sales operations in smaller companies. So, yeah, I think for a lot of people listening to this, maybe they're not exactly clear what sales operations is. So why don't you <laughs> explain that? Yeah, it it could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And um, I remember, you know, back when we got started, so we, we launched in 2011. And when I got started, I remember talking to customers and saying, you know, today you could differentiate against your competitors by being a data-driven sales organization. But at some point in the future, that's just going to be table stakes. Well, guess what? It's the future. And, and what we're seeing is a really, like, sort of meteoric rise 
in sales operations as a function. And one of our goals at Insight Squared is to sort of be that sort of patron saint of sales operations. So we had our inaugural uh, conference last August, and we're having it again uh, this summer. And it, you know, ostensibly it was a customer conference, but really what it was was all around. Uh, elevating the role of sales operations and the strategic value that they provide. So back in the day, so uh, to answer your question, what is sales operations? Uh, it could be the person that runs reports. It could be your Salesforce admin. Uh, it could be um, you know the person that does compensation and territory management. But what we're seeing is a lot of this stuff is rolling up into sort of one organization. And the other change that's happening is you know, it used to be thought that, um, you know, marketing had the program budget and sales had the headcount budget. And uh, what we see, cha- and, you know, it's for years now, people have been talking about what's your marketing stack look like? You know, mm-hmm. What do you use for marketing automation? What do you guys use for, you know, this, that, and the other? And uh, now we're seeing the sales technology stack, which, you know, we, we want to be a clear part of uh, for as many organizations as, as we could deliver value for. Um, but there's a sales technology stack that is owned by sales operations, and that role is broadening. So, you know, I 10 years ago, there were sales operations people, but but mostly at larger organizations. Um, now we're seeing it uh, earlier and earlier in a real sort of strategic career path for people um, to, to, to come up the ranks in, in sales operations. So one of our goals is to figure out how do we serve that community? How do we elevate them in the organization? Because where we see our, with our customers, the greatest success, the fastest growth, the most profitability, whatever the metric is that you're looking at, is when you have a strong sales leader who thinks about the system like an engineer would and paired with a sales operations leader. And, and you know, we, we had Mike Wolf, who's uh, SVP of SMB sales from, uh, from North America from salesforce.com, speak at Ramp last year. And uh, he spoke with his partner in sales operations, and they went back and forth and talked about how they partner and how they work together to drive more revenue. That's a trend I think we're going to start seeing where uh, sales leaders could travel in pairs with sales operations leaders. And we're seeing more and more of that happening at earlier and earlier organizations. So, you know, I, I don't think five years ago a sub 10 million revenue company would have sales operations where now we're seeing it, you know, even even smaller than that. So, you know, my challenge to folks would be think about when can you afford that specialization, that del- division of labor? And if you think you can't afford it, uh, I would reconcile that with your, with your growth objectives. If you have aggressive growth objectives, you're going to want to pull that investment back even further earlier. Yeah, well, I think that once you get outside sort of the tech bubble and where, you know, small companies have, you know, unusually large amounts of money to spend and invest in things as opposed to, you know, sort of standard entrepreneurial startup, five, ten million dollars in revenue, been in business for five, ten years. Yeah, it's a harder calculation for the CEO to make, right? I mean, they're, they're still saying, how do I justify hiring this next salesperson? I guess, but but think about and and I realize this, this is a, a freaking argument made, but just think about the efficiency that you create for the team that you have. So if you have, you know, even ten salespeople, um, if you could, you know, increase their pro- productivity by you know ten percent, that that function pay, pays for itself. And we, I, I see clear path to having that kind of uh, incremental uplift. Well, so where do you, and I'm. You know, this is just for information purposes, not arguing the point is, is, but tell people where you think you see the, the uplift coming from that role. Let's say, you know, 10 person sales team. How does the sales ops person elevate the productivity? Uh, I, I mean, so there, there's a, a broader way of things. First of all, allocating people's time correctly. So the, w- one of the most expensive, I mean, the most expensive uh element of sales is, is, is payroll and, and, and commissions. So if you can make better use of people's time by figuring out, you know, what are the successful people doing and how do you replicate that success? Uh, and then uh, it's not just about activity. It's also around, are you executing your sales plays against the right accounts? Are you responding to the to the right inquiries? Uh, so looking, uh, and, and again, this, this, this is something we try to enable very easily, is looking at the, at the same thing from lots of different perspectives. And to me, analytics is all around identifying trends, finding anomalies and, and understanding them better, 
um, and, and sort of uh, you combine those two things with investigative work, and now you could drill into one of those things. So you know we we have a particularly high conversion rate um, in these types of accounts. Well, what makes those accounts similar? Can we find more accounts like that? Can we market uh, to businesses like that because we have a you know a, a great fit there? So. Um, yeah, if you're there boiling the ocean, and you know, to back to use your example from from 20 years ago, you know, calling the white pages uh, from a cold call perspective, and you realize that you know 80% of your revenue is coming from one very very narrow niche, one one sub industry, you should drop all your other activity and focus on that one industry, and that's how you're going to get outsized uh, returns for a period of time till you sort of uh, reach diminishing returns on that particular vein. But that's the type of d- sort of strategic decision making that sales operations can offer. So you're not your team is not just banging their head against the wall because you know sales like baseball is is a game of misses, right? Like you can you can strike out six out of ten times and and uh, and be a Hall of Fame hitter. Um, and it's the same thing in sales. So it, it's a game of misses. If you can narrow those misses by just a small margin, it's the difference between uh, you know losing your spot and being an all star. I agree, and I think that I love the phrase "the game of misses." Just like similar to golf, people talk about the same thing. Is is um, I think people listening to this, that's what Fred's talking about. Is for you really to understand is that you know we're in a world where increasingly we're specializing the roles within sales, and you know sort of traditional. Sales leadership within a small business is they think they have to do everything. And by trying to do everything, you're not doing anything really well. And this is and so I think what Fred, if you're listening, is you know, making the case is that we really need to analyze, yeah, if we're gonna try to improve our output, our outcomes, improve our outcomes, increase our productivity. Yeah, it's okay for your VP of sales not to be the analytical type, because there's other things, other things they can be doing. Working with your team, coaching, mentoring the people, professional development, uh, deal coaching that can help outcomes as well. Yeah, you said two things there. One is the specialization that you just described. The other one I couldn't emphasize any more is focus. Um, and that's been a as as an, kind of stepping back as an entrepreneur, a lesson I quite frankly wish I learned earlier in in my career, and certainly even earlier in, in my tenure at Inside Squared. That the more focused you get, the better you'll get at that particular thing. Um, and I think that's a that's a, that's something that sales operations can help with is identifying where those veins of gold are, and then working with sales and sales leadership to put the blinders on and focus on those veins of gold. Not until they're completely tapped out, because that 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 could be a very uh, sort of uh, peaks and valleys, uh, painful uh, experience, but um, but focus to sort of start that upward surge and make sure that you find that next vein of gold before it runs out. That focus is what sales operations can bring to an organization. Yeah, and all the time that a, your sales leader that's leading the team is spending on that is time they're not spending on other really productive things they should be doing as well. So yeah, one plus one adds up to more than two, I think, if you get the right person at the right time. Yep. All right. Well, Fred, great conversation. Thank you very much. And tell folks how they can learn more about um, Insight Squared and connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, we're uh, www.insightsquared.com, and I'm at Fred Schilm over on Twitter if they want to connect with me. All right. Excellent. Well, Fred, thank you. Friends, thank you for spending this time with us today. Make sure you come back uh, for the next great episode of Accelerate. Until then, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. 